I had to go to work right after I uploaded my last video on the Festus disk. The Festus disk is authentic, Minoan, and Latin. And right after I got there, lightning hit the factory. Now I'm sure it happens all the time and I never notice, but this time the building shook. I was actually worried that somebody had set off a bomb. Well, not too long after that, I see everybody is standing around chatting because their machines are down, except for mine. My machines are still working. Well, on her way out the door that morning, a woman who worked there for more than 20 years commented, without my prompting, that nothing like that had ever happened in all the time that she'd been there. Well, that's very interesting, especially when you think about one of the major topics of that video, the Vedic god Indra and his thunderbolt, which seems to have made an appearance on the Festus disk and at my factory. Well, now that I've proven the Festus disk is authentic, I could make a move on a lot of things that I've had my eye on for quite a while, but couldn't bring up in my videos in good conscience or in good faith because they're proof that the Festus disc was authentic or proof that it was a fraud because a lot of these artifacts were discovered before the Festus disc. But now all of those roadblocks have been lifted and let's march on down that road. Because the first thing Italians do when they start writing is they start writing in spirals. And who does that? The Minoans did all over the island. This is the gravestone from Belante. Starts from the left, wraps over his head, and then completely around his body. Then it finishes back on the left again, hugging his right leg. Stili of Mogliano, wraps over the top and under the bottom. Stili of Servigliano, wraps over the top. Stili of Loro Picino. This starts from the right, goes up to the center, back down the center, back up through the center, and then down on the left again. Not a spiral, but still rounded, an exception. This is called Bustrophodon, back and forth as the ox plows. The warrior of Capistrano. As you can see, the writing starts up from the left, doesn't wrap around or anything. It just shows you they expected to do a lot of up and down reading, which you would if you were reading spirals all the time. Look at all those spirals. The Italians got their writing from the Greeks and the Phoenicians. Did they get that idea from them? Not that I've ever seen. This is the first Greek we know of, and it's on the side of a cup, so if they wrote in spirals, they'd certainly write that way there. This is the cup of Nestor, but nope, no spiral. They're writing straight across, just like we do, or the best they can considering it's a rounded cup. But wait, what's this? Looks like our Festus disc, doesn't it? Which we know was authentic. This is the disc of Magliano. It's not refined like our disc, but obviously inspired by it. Here's a clear drawing of the Magliano disc. It was recovered long before the Festus disc. A fantastic sun disc. Lines just like this had already been seen flanking the goddess for 6,000 years by the time this disc was produced. And as you'll see, they did on Minoan Crete too. The bull, of course, is the emblem par excellence for, of the Minoans. And there are two dogs, Canis Major and Canis Minor. As I said in my last video, the dog star Sirius is probably the subject of the Minoan libation formula. And notice there was something in the center. In the center of our disc on side A, we have the Ka, which I think was our subtle name for God. In fact, as I showed the secret name for God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, I am that I am, was probably inspired by the Ka, as was that whole scene with Moses in the burning bush. So now that I knew that the Italians knew about the Festus disc, I originally worked under the assumption that literacy continued in Italy in the late Bronze Age and into the early Iron Age. But the more I entertained that possibility, the more I realized that it was impossible. We would know if they had literacy in that peninsula because they would leave something behind, a tombstone or something. The more likely explanation is they had a Festus disc, but they didn't know how to read it. They knew it was a sun disc, they knew it was religious, and they knew details of the Minoan religion. That's obvious from the sun disc that they actually did create. And when literacy returned to Italy, they used the Festus disc as a model for their own writing. Kind of like Renaissance sculptors used the Greek masters as inspiration. But they didn't know about the movable type that went into creating it, although I'm sure they were woefully aware of their inability to recreate it. Nevertheless, centuries after the Festus disc disappeared, or I would like to think, buried with some priest whose remains we will discover within my lifetime, it still had a major impact on local native Italic poetry, and that includes Latin poetry. And this impact stretched on into the New Testament. Amazing and true. I'm going to prove it.
This ritual is a poem, probably written at the very beginning of the Roman Republic. We're looking at about 500 BC. First, I would note the large number of quaes in it. Just like the Festus disc, that's the first thing that should have tipped off specialists that the disc might have been written in an early form of Latin. The Sanskrit version is ka. The Latin is older and was around at the time of the Minoans. In fact, it goes right back to Proto-Indo-European. Father Mars, I pray and beseech you that you be favorable and propitious to me, my house, and our household, to which end I have ordered the sui turilia to be driven around my field, land, and farm. So we have two trinities here. Indo-Europeans are big on trinities. We have a triple sacrifice of a pig, a ram, and a bull, and we have my field, land, and farm. That you forbid, ward off, and brush aside diseases seen and unseen, depopulation and devastation, storms and tempests, and that you let grow tall and turn out well, grains and corn and vineyards and shrub work, and keep safe shepherds and cattle, and give good health and soundness to me, my house, and our household. To these ends, to purify and perform the purification of my farm, land, and field, so as I spoke, be magnified by the suckling sui turilia to be sacrificed. Father Mars, to that end, be magnified by the suckling sui turilia. Now this is a very complex poem, very Indo-European. As one scholar said, it can be as old as you want it to be. Let's look at part of that complexity. But you will notice first, the farmer is circling, very Festus Discian, but it gets better. Father Mars frames Father Mars. I will do the purification. I have done the purification. Keep off diseases. Give good health. As one scholar noticed, this is one of a trinity of things Indo-Europeans fretted over. Sovereignty, in this case, that includes good health. The only way you can be sovereign in your own body. Keep off depopulation. Keep safe. Force. Keep off storms. Let grow tall grain and corn. Prosperity. Throw that in with a circumambulation around the field, and you've got a spiral. Altogether, a perfect literary translation of a spiraling Festus disc. This continues into Christianity. The Mark and Sandwich technique. We didn't even notice this until the 1970s. Here's an example. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please, come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. There was a woman, afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, If I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. These sandwiches even have toothpicks to hold them together. Here it's the 12 years. The girl is 12 and the woman has been ill for 12 years. Is there circulation? Yes. The Gospel of Mark tracks the Zodiac. It's a very complex piece exactly like our farmers write. Scholars have thought for quite a while that Mark could easily have been written in Rome. And since they're using a specifically Italic literary technique, I think it's very likely. And I think this is the Holy Spirit speaking. I have not forgotten the Minoans. She doesn't stop speaking, believe me. Or not. I'll show you. I'm not going to cover this whole book, obviously. You should read it. He's nailed it. Aries. 
Mark 1, 1 through 335. Beginnings. Three sandwiches here, called intercalaries by scholars. Mark 2, 1 through 12, 3, 1 through 6, and 3, 20 through 35. The healing of the paralytic brackets Jesus' authority to forgive sins. The healing of the withered hand brackets the Sabbath controversy. The rejection by Jesus' family brackets the rejection by Jewish leaders. The toothpicks are, he says to the paralytic, he says to the man, and his family or his mother went. Taurus covers 4.1 through 4.34. No sandwiches here that we know of. I'll talk about this in a few. Abundance and fecundity. Gemini covers 435 through 629. Mutability and fragmentation largely governs here. Two sandwiches, 521 through 543 and 67 through 630. We've seen the first sandwich already. Jer Jairus' daughter brackets the ill woman. In the second one, the sending out of the twelve brackets the death of John the Baptist. The toothpick is, he instructed them, followed by, the apostles instructed him. Cancer is 630 through 821. The hallmark is seclusion and the stomach. There's a joke in here. Jesus is scuttering back and forth between towns in a manner that makes no sense because he's a crab and crabs walk sideways. The sandwich is Mark 7, 1 through 23. Unwashed hands bracket the Corbin controversy. I want to explain that. You should look it up. It won't kill you to do a little Bible reading. The toothpick is defile. Leo, 822 through 929. Kingship, sonship. No sandwiches here that we know of. Virgo, 930 through 50. Kenosis, emptying. This sandwich here encompasses most of the Virgo section and carries on into half of Libra. 936 through 1016. Blessing children brackets his teaching on divorce. The toothpick is child and children. Libra, 10, 1 through 31, division and harmony. Shares a sandwich with Virgo. These are both pretty short sections, which means they might be incomplete. Scorpio, 10, 32 through 52, death and regeneration. Now, I've indicated several times that we might be missing some of the sandwiches in Mark. Actually, I know we are, and one of them is here. The bread is 10, 32 through 34 and 10, 35 through 45. And the meat is secret mark. It's not in your Bible right now, but I'm sure it belongs there. It's not all of secret mark, but this particular section is known as the gay gospel. And in fact, the scholar who discovered it on the West Bank, Morton Smith, was himself a homosexual. The document disappeared sometime after 1990 from the Greek Orthodox Patriarch Library in Jerusalem. And critics of the document consider that to be convenient. And I agree, it is convenient. For them. There's more than enough physical evidence to prove that this thing is a whether or not this thing is a modern fraud. And even if it isn't, and I don't care either way, it could still be a 400 year old fraud. But again, either way, I need to know so I can stop wasting my time with this thing. But I have to keep wasting my time with this thing because it's a resurrection story, which means it fits perfectly into Scorpio. And Morton Smith didn't know about this zodiac connection. And on top of that, this is the meat of a literary sandwich. And people didn't know about the mark and sandwich technique until the 1970s, which, didn't have, which was 20 years after the document was discovered. Now, it is a touch homoerotic. It's a young man who's wealthy. He's naked underneath the linen cross, underneath the linen cloth, and he spends the night alone with Jesus. But that same young man is naked under that cloth at night with Jesus when Jesus is arrested with a large group of people. There's nothing homoerotic about that. Okay. Now remember, this young man had been resurrected, so this could be a burial cloth. And it might be the cloth that was used to bury Jesus, in which case you can still visit it. It's the Shroud of Turin. Yes, lovers have their secrets, but so do the dead. Sagittarius, 11.1 through 11.26. The bestial and the spiritual. We have a sandwich with 11.12 through 21. The cursing of the fig tree brackets the cleansing of the temple. The toothpick is fig tree and leaf and the fig tree withered. Capricorn, 1127 through 1244. Authority, no intercalaries that we know of. Aquarius, 13.1 through 1416. The old must make way for the new. 
Here we have two intercalaries, 13, 5 through 23, and 14, 1 through 11. The warnings of the false Christ bracket the prophecy that the temple will be destroyed. The toothpick is, will lead astray and to lead astray. The plot to kill Jesus brackets the anointing at Bethany. The toothpick is, were seeking to kill and was seeking to betray. And now we end with Pisces. 14.17 through 16.18. The end is the beginning. We have at least two intercalaries, 14.53 through 72 and 15.40 through 16.1. Peter's denial brackets Jesus' trial. The toothpick was Peter had followed and Peter was below. And finally, the women bracket the burial of Jesus. The toothpick is Mary Magdalene. These are the Igivine tablets. They're written in Umbrian, which is an Italic language very closely related to Latin. They also have a nesting structure, although theirs is a lot tougher for me to muscle through. I'll be getting back to them after I upload this video. So why would there be a Festus disc in Italy? Well, if you saw what the Minoans were up to in the years leading up to the revolution of 1450 BC that threw them out of power, you would see that such an important work of art and technology and theology designed from the ground up to be perfectly reproducible, especially with movable type, perfectly fit their needs. They had one in Italy, and they probably had one in important cities like Miletus on the west coast of Turkey, too. Let's look at the evidence. One of the most important of the new trading ventures involved increased trade with Italy and other areas to the west. The introduction of the Aegean weight system into these new regions indicates the seriousness of the policy involving trade in this direction. The Western Mediterranean offered vast amounts of raw materials, timber, hides, foods, and potentially even metals, to compensate for local Aegean and Near Eastern resources that were increasingly being depleted. Purple dye for the murex shell may have also come from the West. In return, the Minoans could provide luxury goods to an almost untapped market. Finds of metal objects in Crete and discoveries of Minoan pottery in Italy and Italian pottery in Crete demonstrate that Italian trade was an important component of Minoan foreign policy. From The Meanings of Standardization, Conical Cups in the Late Bronze Age Aegean. The distinct selection of the raw materials and the exclusive use of the wheel have in both cases been interpreted as stemming from the producer's and customer's desire to make or purchase pottery that imitates the Cretan product as perfectly as possible. This pattern is also visible in other Minoanizing shapes, but it's most complete among the conical cups discussed here. Conical cups were an essential ingredient of Minoan lifestyle. They played a vital role in secular and sacred contexts and are associated with drinking or feasting. Buying into this lifestyle and participating in meaningful rituals may have fostered Islanders' desire to create or possess a perfect copy of an item so closely associated with Minoan culture. Potters at Aya Irini and Philocopi appear to differ, however, in their approach to dimensional standardization. Conical dimensions in Aya Irini became less variable over time. If internal competition is accepted as a potential explanation, we need to postulate as yet unrecognized changes in the pottery organization or in customer demand. At Philocopi, on the other hand, conical cups remain variable in their dimensions throughout. If this is due to lack of competition, change, lack of change in the production organization, a greater variety of functions, lack of customer demand, or cultural resistance against such standardization it is, is as yet uncertain. From the Minoans in Central, Eastern, and Northern Aegean, New Evidence. An obvious area for discussion is the fact that economic, social, and probably political relationships changed. For example, as we have seen, Miletus was wholly Minoan in period four, less so in the preceding period three. Trianda had clear late Minoan 1B elements, but, as shown by Tula Marketu, was a much more cosmopolitan community than its much more strongly Minoan form in late Minoan 1A. So Miletus, as I mentioned before, became even more Minoan. Trianda kind of fell away, an exception to overall trends, and perhaps evidence that the Minoans wanted to fortify their culture against more stray sheep. I say it would have worked brilliantly. For the last 100 years, we thought that the Greeks had conquered the Minoans on Crete, but a recent strontium isotopic analysis of the bones of the so-called Greek invaders has shown that they were in fact native to Crete. This is not a representative sample, but every example we have so far tells us the same story. 
And it's good to point out that in the beginning, Sir Arthur Evans, the man who discovered the Minoans, was convinced that they were overthrown by a revolution. It's only later that he was convinced otherwise. So now the story has gotten very weird. I was annoyed when I saw the results of that survey because the story of an invasion and conquest is easy to follow, easy to grok. Well now we're all in the wilderness again. I'm sure we're all in for a lot of surprises. So what I think happened is this. I think the Greeks took one look at the Festus disc and they were horrified. I think rank and file native Cretans were as well because they both knew it was going to work. And the Cretans knew they were going to be under the thumb of their weird Minoan elites forever. I think by this time, most, if not all of them, already spoke Greek, so they cut a deal. But the Festus disc bore fantastic fruit in Italy, and I think it tells us a lot that a thousand miles away, it captured the imagination of a group of people so bigly that it inspired a literary technique 800 years after the Minoans were dead, gone, and forgotten. Had they pulled this off, Knossos, the capital of the Minoan Empire, would have been Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem all rolled into one, and we would have had the printing press thousands of years ahead of schedule. Go ahead and let it out. I wanted to cry too. My positive identification of the Festus disc as a sun disc also opened other doors for me. For example, there's the god that I variously identified as the Lord or the Lord of Ditka, or even the Sky Father when I didn't know any better. Now I know who this god is, and I know where he fits into the bigger picture. Here's Crete. Let's zoom in on the center where most of the action happened. To the east, where the sun rises, we have Mount Ditka, which I have called the Mountain of the Father. To the west, where the sun sets, we've got the Mountain of the Mother. Between them, we've got the world of the Minoans. To the north, we've got the city of Knossos, and southwest of that city, Festus. The os suffix indicates you're looking at a city, and so now it's obvious what these cities' names are. City of Knowledge, and the City of Light. Scholars like to pretend there's no way of telling whether or not the Minoans are Indo-Europeans, but unless you're looking at some pretty wild coincidences, they clearly were. The Mountain of the Mother is Mount Ida, and that's Indo-European. The cities not only look like knowledge and light, but knowledge and light go together naturally. And knowledge, Gnosis, is classically a woman that's coming back around. And light in Minoan Crete was apparently a man. Now, just to the west of Festos, to the left, you'll see a town mark Aegea Triada Villa, and there you will find mention of something important called Saria. I'm confident this is the sun god, and this is the very same sun god, Surya, in the Rig Veda. You can't get more Indo-European and Aryan than the Rig Veda. Until now, it was considered the oldest scripture in the world, and it is the ultimate foundation of the Hindu religion. Although now, since I think we wrote at least the foundational portions of Genesis, the Old Testament is back in play as potentially the oldest scripture. All the line drawings you're about to see are from the book Minoan Religion by Nana Morinatos. She actually did a major reworking of everything she talks about here in a later book, but right now I'm working on the language so I haven't gotten to it yet. I'm sure there are a million surprises waiting for me. Here's the famous throne room at Knossos. You can visit it to this very day. They thought this room was meant for a king until they realized the butt was made for a woman. When I talk about the goddess enthroned, she literally had a throne. And this is it, in Knossos, the city of knowledge. And remember, Gnosis is a woman, so everything fits. This room has not been restored properly. There were palm trees flanking the throne. One of them shows up in the original excavation photo. Here's a restoration. I think there were just two of them. The one on her left was actually seen. Recently, a spectacular warrior grave was discovered on mainland Greece, and this ring shows he had been in this very room. You can clearly see the two trees. And here's our fresco of the Prince of the Lilies. Everyone agrees this hasn't been properly restored. I'm sure he's supposed to be holding up the Axis Mundi, a staff. No doubt in Minoan theology he marries the lady. Here he is holding the Axis as expected, and he's grabbed her by the wrist, a very erotic gesture. This is the palace at Knossos. The Festus disc was discovered at the palace of Festus. Here's our throne room. The corridor of the procession is here, coming up from the south. The Saria is coming up to marry Our Lady. And over here in this corridor, this is where we found our Prince of the Lilies. So the Lady is a foundation of the Axis Mundi. Here she is on Crete on the left, 
Then centuries later, the renowned pillars of the Kingdom of Palestine in northern Syria reflect that same theology. These are the same lions you see on the sun disk in Italy. This isn't a casual or trivial coincidence. This is big time. This is important. Saria descends the axis on his daily trek from the sky to the earth, and then he ascends again when he returns. It only dawned on me after I proved the Festus disk was authentic and a sun disk that he was a sun god. He goes down into the earth and on into the world of the dead, and then comes back out again. On Crete, just like in Egypt. Once I realized that, a lot of things on Crete started making sense. Now, Minoans had a trinity, because they are Indo-Europeans, and two of them are men. My problem was I kept confusing their role in the trinity to such an extent that I was conflating the one with the other. The third person is the old man. You see him with a bow, and he's a hunter. I know the Minoans had a trinity because they had three priesthoods, and each of those priests would imitate that god. They had a young woman for the lady, a young man for Saria, and an old man for the old man. I haven't found him named yet, but I'm confident he's Indra. Although, the Vedas talk about the fabulous island of Atala, the white island in the western sea on the other side of the world from India. That's probably Atlantis, which we built and was destroyed on the island of Thera. As I said in my video engaging the alt-right, whenever you expect a unicorn to come galloping around the corner, start looking for us. So, they knew about us. But if they're right, then we might not have called him Indra after all. We might have called him Narayana, because they said we were monotheists and that's what we called him. See, I told you we were monotheists. Although, I think it's more likely we called him Indra. Look at him, center left. Then the Lord, Indra. The presence of the Vajra on Minoan Crete is, I think, testimony to that equivalence. Now let's go back to the palace at Knossos. A little south of the throne room, we have a pillar crypt. Notice it's on the west. That's important, just like Saria is coming from the south. This is related to the cult of the dead. Notice the empty tomb. A day doesn't go by when I don't swear I'm looking at Christians. In fact, I've been thinking of na naming my main video Christianity Before Moses. This type of room is only at Knossos, and it's the extension of something that had been happening out in the countryside surrounding the metropolis. Here is a temple tomb. Notice the pillars. They're important. At the pillar crypt and in this tomb, the offerings were almost exclusively male. Weapons, especially. Because coming out of this were the world's first gladiators, which is exactly what we're looking at. In Rome, as here, they are explicitly connected with death and honoring the dead. Notice the pillar. Specifically, if you're a man, you need to learn how to live well, and the only way to do that is to learn how to die well, because you might someday be called on to put it all on the line. Notice the pillars. Hagia Triada, where we find the documentation on Saria. And here he is receiving an offering of hides from a posse of young men, probably landless, penniless aristocrats, just exactly like Romulus and Remus who founded Rome. They would have fit right in. They've come to Saria, no doubt to learn how to die well, and who better to teach that than a god who dies and is resurrected every day. And here we have a transitional Apollo. We called him Saria, but he didn't stick with that name. Apollo, in the common or Proto-Greek form Apelion, securely reconstructable from Doric, that includes Cretan, Laconian, Corinthian, etc., as originally proposed by Burkert, 1975, the name is derived from a word preserved in Doric, Apelli, assembly, but as Peter shows, the original meaning must have rather been the Indo-European institution of Manabund, the hunter-warrior society of unmarried and propertyless young aristocrats, Macon. Apollo, Apelion, in this aspect, was leader of such a band, Apelia. Apollo's role in the later Greek pantheon is, of course, much broader. Whether his later connection with the sun can be projected back to the second millennium is uncertain at best, but it is clear in the Iliad that Apollo is the special patron of the city of Troy, also called Ilios, and the Trojans. You cannot get more Aryan than an Apelion leading an Apelia, a Manabund, and we are big time, big blue blood Aryans. I also think I've just proven Apollo does go back to the second millennium. Actually, that's exactly backwards. There never was an Apollo until Saria started going by that name. One more thing about Saria before we move on. There's probably a little detail you missed. He is beautifully built and well mounted. It was the same with the Hittites. And before them, the Hatti, probably. This particular feature we probably both got from them. His manhood is new. 
So when all of my talk about sun gods and phalluses, I forgot all about my C.G. Young 101, the solar phallus man, holy cow. This is where Carl Jung got the idea for the collective unconscious. I talk about the collective unconscious a lot in my videos. In fact, in my video IQ+, Plus, I show that it's especially strong with us, often rising to the level of a racial memory. That's the plus in the IQ+. Plus. I also talk about it in my video, Engaging the Alt-Right. In fact, I give a pretty spectacular example of it there. This is from the blog Mythfire. Archetypes in the Collective Unconscious, The Spectacular Adventures of the Solar Phallus Man. A hundred years on, we know that his name was Emil Schweizer. This is Dr. Young. One day I came across him there, blinking through the window up at the sun, and moving his head from side to side in a curious manner. He took me by the arm and said he wanted to show me something. He said I must look at the sun with eyes half shut, and then I could see the sun's phallus. If I moved my head from side to side, the sun phallus would move too, and that was the origin of the wind. So four years later, Young is steeped in his studies of mythology and comes across several references that paralleled Schweizer's vision to a most uncanny degree. The first reference was found in a liturgy of visions, instructions, and invocations most likely belonging to an ancient Mithraic cult. Okay, One of the visions reads as follows, and likewise the so-called tube, the origin of the ministering wind. For you will see hanging down from the disk of the sun something that looks like a tube, and towards the regions westward it is as though there were an infinite east wind. But if the other wind should prevail towards the regions of the east, you will in like manner see the vision veering in that direction. Young goes on to note that as the Greek word for tube also means a wind instrument, then evidently a stream of wind is blowing through the tube out of the sun. Now there are other parallels and similar logic holds to them. These include medieval paintings depicting the Immaculate Conception of Christ by way of a tube reaching down from heaven before it disappears beneath the robes of Mary. The Holy Ghost in the form of a dove flies down through the tube to impregnate her. In discussing this image, Young writes, As we know from the miracle of the Pentecost, the Holy Ghost was originally conceived as a mighty rushing wind, the wind that bloweth where it listeth. In a Latin text we read, Animo decensis per orbum solis tribuitor. They say that the Spirit descends through the disk of the sun. Like I said, the Holy Spirit speaks, even in insane asylums. There are thousands of good examples of the collective unconscious in action that could have inspired Carl Jung. Why this one? Now there's another thing about the sun. Where does it set? To the west. Thus, Aegea Triada in its Saria is west of Festos. And the pillar crypt is in the western half of the palace at Knossos. And in the wintertime, where does the sun ride? Along the southern border of the sky. Thus, it's best to have a house with a southern exposure, with awnings over the window. So in the winter, when the sun is low, you can see it. And in the summer, when it's high, you don't. Thus, Festos is south of Knossos, and the wedding procession comes in from the south. So we have death, and we have resurrection, and we have a wedding. Just like Christ who's crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rises from the dead. And someday he will come collect the church, his bride, into the bridal chamber. Now there's a question of whether or not we had human sacrifice. And I think we did in extreme circumstances, all the way into the Roman Republic. That is documented. But there's another way of looking at gladiators as a voluntary sacrifice. We who sacrifice ourselves for our kind and kin salute you. Just as Christ voluntarily sacrificed himself for his flock. For like any great leader, he wouldn't have us do anything that he wouldn't do himself, including ostracism, humiliation, torture, and murder. Christianity before Moses. You better believe it. And now that we know he's a sun god, the family resemblance cannot escape us. Apollo and Syria. The Apollo on the left is from the era of the very early Roman Republic. I've said in previous videos that the further we go back, the more the Romans start looking like Minoans. As we see from the literature, the more they acted like Minoans, too. Even the long, wavy hair makes sense now. One of my brothers used to grow his hair out exactly like that. They're sun rays. But our Apollo is a double transitional Apollo. I think we invented the wheel in an effort to recreate the cosmos. I first talked about that in my video, The Gods Descend. But I've also pointed out several times, we did not invent the chariot. That was done by our cousins out on the steppes of Russia. So it shouldn't be a surprise that on Crete we have an Apollo with the axis mundi, the axle of a wheel or chariot, and the chariot came later. 
Here we see Apollo emerging out of the underworld, out of the land of the dead. Here's the earth and the sky. Here's the axis mundi connecting the two. We obsessed over that image in our so-called Danube script, clearly an ancestor of the linear A used on Minoan Crete. Notice the spinning things, loads of them. And look at this symbol here. I've had my eye on it for a couple of years now because I knew it was important, but I had no idea what to make of it. Now I know it's an arrow, a thunderbolt, the Vajra of Indra, and Zeus, all the way back to the Neolithic Balkan Peninsula. Imagine that. Notice the runner, bottom center. That's important because one of the ancient Indo-European words for wheel is rotos, rotor, which means runner, and there he is. The Balkans, where we lived, also shows the first archaeological evidence of the wheel, so it's not hard to put those two and twos together. Unfortunately, when we gave the sun god a chariot, we broke Minoan theology, but that's okay, because Christianity literally resurrected it. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen. I say to you, no one could see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can a person once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I have told you you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wills, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can this happen? Jesus answered and said to him, you are the teacher of Israel, and you do not understand this? Amen, amen, I say to you. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I tell you about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Even the phallus is here. Amazing. So we're not only all over Mark, we're all over John, too. But I already knew that because we're obviously the other flock the Lord talked about in John. Sorry, Mormons. You missed the boat on that one. As I've said... I've always felt like I've been dealing with Bronze Age Christians. And when I finally do my main video, and we'll pencil in the title Christianity Before Moses for now, I'm going to show that we probably wrote a lot of the Old Testament. And Genesis makes it clear that the Godhead is in fact a plurality, probably a trinity. And one of the persons in this trinity is a woman. I've known that for years, but I finally found a contemporary trinity worshipped by people who had a large stake in Palestine at the time. We know this is true. Thus, everything fits perfectly. Even our most famous symbol looks Christian. A lot like a cross, right? The labrys, the double-headed axe. It's well known that this is a symbol of the goddess, and it's become the emblem of lesbians. But the axe has two faces, so you're looking at two gods, or rather, one god with two equal faces, with the axis mundi acting as an intermediary, a third god. Thus, the labrys is the perfect encapsulation of the Minoan Trinity. Now in my last video, I talk about how we drew our religion from the same well as the Vedas, which became the foundation of Hinduism. But I also talk about how we had an argument with those people, how there were trends emerging that we did not like. Well, in a way, one of our bigger arguments with them is the same as we had with the Greeks. Our Trinity is the wheel, or rather the wheel assemblage that allows a cart to move, and later a chariot. Which wheel is more important? Which wheel is more important than the axle? Who's more important, mother or father? Are they more important than the child? The Greeks humiliated the lady by reducing her majesty to the trivial, petty jealousy of Hera. And the Hindus would reduce the majesty of the earth 
to the trivial petty Maya illusion. We say, no way. The world is real. The world is important. The world is good. Let the will of God be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Obviously, our theology is fulfilled in Christianity, which insists we must have a literal physical resurrection. And if you do not insist on that, you are not a Christian because we are not complete without our bodies. As extended by later philosophers, there is no split between body and soul. The body is a soul, and it extends all the way to heaven. We are able to enjoy the immortal things in our body because from the soles of our feet to the tippy top of our third eye, we are immortal. I talk about that in my video, Engaging the Alt-Right. It's fantastic, you should check it out. It's one of my favorite videos, I seem to be going back to it. But I must bring this video to a satisfying close, and I have a mountain of work to get back to. Between this video and the last one, I've accomplished my goal. I've made new breakthroughs on the Festus disc, and I've staked my claims to those breakthroughs. Probably not going to be back for two, three months, unless I have more breakthroughs that I need to stake my claim to. Either way, this has been a fun ride, and there's so much more to do. You make it a good day.